And they've become this really concerningly large group of believers in, the, in what's effectively like an extremist ideology that's totally divorced from reality. An increase in political polarization, mistrust in institutions, a huge megaphone provided by the internet. All of these factors have created an environment for conspiracies to run rampant. When that trust is lost, um, there's kind of an information gap, um, I suppose, which really allows um, misinformation and misleading claims uh, to thrive. Conspiracy theories are definitely nothing new. But we have seen um, something really strange happening in the last, I'd say, probably about seven years, which is sort of an intensification of really deliberate disinformation that is linked to conspiracy theories. And on January 6th, the threat these groups can pose was highlighted. Procedure and decorum in Congress shattered today when a peaceful protest turned into a siege, when some Trump supporters pushed through barricades and stormed the Capitol. Many followers of the online movement were among those who participated in that deadly riot. Federal law enforcement officials dropping the hammer down on some of the more visible alleged rioters, including this horn-helmed, face-painted, spear-wielding man, Jacob Chansley, self-described as the QAnon shaman. But the Capitol riot is not the first time an online conspiracy has posed an offline threat. There were instances in the preceding years of individuals who subscribed to QAnon either plotting or in some cases successfully carrying out acts of violence. And the rise in these types of movements is leaving people wondering what's going on. A lot of times these things boil down to a person has a gap in his or her life, can't explain that gap. And this thing, this either conspiracy theory or this pseudoscientific belief fills that gap and supplies them with that emotional support that they just were not getting otherwise. We're taking a look at the rise in extremism, the role that social media plays in censorship, and how fringe theories make it to the forefront. KSAT explains. KSAT explains. KSAT explains. KSAT explains. in-depth perspective. Perspective on stories we bring you in our newscasts throughout the day. We're looking into concerns over voting safety during a pandemic and the battle over mail-in voting. A look at how the protests and demonstrations have played out in our city and an examination of what it means to be black in San Antonio. An issue that you have likely felt the effects of, rising property taxes. The roots of Tejano run deep in South Texas. We examine the cultural impact the music has had in San Antonio. This week's episode of Case That Explains explores how theories make it into the mainstream. Thanks for joining us for this episode of KSAT Explains. I'm Myra Arthur. This week, we're talking about a phenomenon that's underway across the U.S., the recent surge of conspiracy theories, how far-flung false ideas are no longer hidden in the far corners of the Internet, but they're now talked about in mainstream media because belief in them has become so widespread. QAnon, for example, one such conspiracy theory that you might have heard of. If you're confused by it, you're not alone. But believers are far from alone either. QAnon has supporters across the country. We saw some of them storm the Capitol during the insurrection as President Donald Trump's term came to an end, proving that these online theories can have real world implications. First up in this episode, we explain an overview of what QAnon is and how it grew out of the shadows into the mainstream. It all started with a post on the anonymous message board 4chan in 2017. 4chan is kind of a place where everyone's anonymous. It's like one of these free speech zones that just tolerates all sorts of hate speech and horrible kind of dirty memes and that kind of thing. Washington Post reporter Drew Harwell has been following the rise of QAnon for the last year. And at the time, back in 2017, it was sort of promising. It had this secret intelligence about Hillary Clinton being arrested for a lot of the same totally bogus claims that you'd seen with Pizzagate and some of these other conspiracy theories. That promise set the wheels in motion. It got attention and gained a following, growing into what QAnon is today. QAnon is a big bundle of sprawling conspiracy theories that are totally extreme and totally devoid of evidence. But what they say is that 
there's this secret holy war being played out behind the scenes where there's this cabal of Satan worshiping, child trafficking, bad guys who also control the US government, control the deep state, control the media, control the world. That's a lot, but there's even more. On the other side, there is Donald Trump leading this kind of covert resistance against the QAnon forces and doing it in this very secretive way, only kind of revealing clues in these, um, you know, uh, cryptic, cryptic ways. According to QAnon, there would be this moment when President Trump and the military would swoop in and have mass arrests and arrest all of these Democrats and media elites and celebrities, and then actually put them to death for treason and for, for their satanic crimes. That's really, really scary. And about the only other time I can think of that we've seen historically a conspiracy theory that is linked essentially to a call for, for mass extinction of one's opponents would be um, in Nazi Germany in the 1930s. And yet, QAnon has seemed to flourish, amassing believers across the US. I think a lot of people who imagine a conspiracy theory think these are a bunch of, you know, low lives living in the basement, no, no social interaction, no job, that kind of thing. Um, it's a really easy stereotype to go to, and it's actually doesn't seem to be true in this case, right? Um, I've talked to men, women, college graduates, not college graduates, rural, urban. QAnon crosses all of those boundaries. So how did it happen? How did a set of far-fetched beliefs lacking any evidence spread so far and wide? The answer is a cocktail of key ingredients. First, social media. The tech companies were very slow to react, right? A lot of this QAnon discussion and organization and recruitment was playing out on Twitter and Facebook and these other big mainstream social media sites that people spend all their time on. We want to believe that everything in our feed is just sort of appearing in real time. So if my mom posts something and then my dad posts something and then my, my uh, uncle, I'll see those things kind of show up in real time. But these social media platforms actually have decided that they want to show us what we like the most because they want us to stick around. So whether we're watching YouTube videos or, or looking at things in Facebook or Instagram, that the platform is figuring out what we're interested in. And it figures it out by what we click on. And so the more you click on something, the more it thinks you're interested in that. And it kind of creates this self-reinforcing loop. So I, I think there are many um, anecdotal cases of people who became radicalized into the QAnon theory by watching one video, maybe it was something uh, innocuous, like save the children, just in general about child sex trafficking. And then because of that, YouTube or, or Facebook, the algorithm decides, oh, well, they're interested in this topic. Let me give them this other thing that's somewhat adjacent. And, and very easily, they, they kind of slipped into this rabbit hole. That's another part of the mix. QAnon latched onto causes that almost anyone can get behind, like opposing child trafficking. And yet people who started to, to attach that attach themselves to that as, as, a, as an important cause, sort of gradually started seeing more and more QAnon material. And so you'll see these protests that advertise themselves as being sort of pro-children, anti-child trafficking that are actually kind of QAnon protests in disguise. There's also money to be made in QAnon. People sell books, t-shirts, they gain followers on their own social media accounts. Then there was another ingredient. Now former President Donald Trump, a key figure in QAnon, never really denounced it. He kind of defended it in a way by saying, oh, I hear it's people who, you know, care about America or who don't like child trafficking, which of course, who, who, who does like child trafficking? I know nothing about QAnon. I do know they are very much against uh, pedophilia. January 6th, 2021 comes. A protest in support of President Trump turns into a riot at the nation's capital. Ultimately, Trump leaves office, but QAnon is still here. We saw people go from QAnon sort of pro-Trump stuff to voter fraud to now vaccine misinformation where they're spreading lies about vaccines or masks or, you know, quote unquote, medical tyranny. And so people are finding a way to stay somewhere around the QAnon conspiracy mindset while also kind of spinning their, their beliefs forward for a new day. 
It may have shocked so many of us, but the siege at the U.S. Capitol was not a surprise to those who've been closely monitoring groups like QAnon for years. And we should point out that Q is far from the only conspiracy theory surging. RJ Marquez explains there's been a growing trend towards extremism for years now. The violence at the Capitol was no surprise. Researchers have been saying for weeks and months that we were seeing a rise in violent rhetoric uh, about uh, the election. Peter Montgomery is a senior fellow at People for the American Way. His group has been monitoring the rise in right wing extremism in the U.S. Extremism in U.S. politics and in our culture has been there for a long time. What's really different in the last several years has been the explosive power of social media to enable promoters of extremist ideology to find their recruits to create uh, communities of believers. While QAnon worked its way into the mainstream, conspiracists have always been out there. As early as um, I think 1799, there were people talking about a supposed Masonic conspiracy and the Illuminati supposedly uh, had infiltrated the American Revolution. And since then, there have been several others, from those who believe JFK's death was a hoax to those theories about cell phone towers and vaccinations. But through online forums, these different conspiracy theories brought more people together, especially over the past year. You know, all these things were just a way for people to to try to um, explain what was going on in their life. And, and in the meanwhile, they built community, almost in the same way that people uh, get drawn into cults. In 2009, the Department of Homeland Security released a report warning that right-wing extremism was on the rise in the U.S. and it could lead to violence. There was a flourishing of new uh, right-wing coalitions on the right that happened right after Obama's election, that people who uh, were willing maybe to partner with folks that they might otherwise have kept their distance from because they saw him as, as uh, such a threat to um, you know, their conservative ideals about how the government should run or about who should be running the government. And since then, it's become even harder to pinpoint where the real threats online are coming from. Conversations that occur online that include a threat of violence obviously far, far outweigh the actual use of violence. So it's the proverbial needle in a haystack problem where you have all of these very loud signals that are constantly going on, but to actually find the signal amidst that noise is much, much harder. Social media has become a double-edged sword for authorities. While it helps identify potential threats, many conspiracists on these boards and dark rooms have also managed to relocate to the fringes of social media or create new platforms if they are kicked off sites like Twitter or Reddit. The question many people are asking in the wake of what we have seen this past year is what causes someone to become this radicalized? Experts say it can be a series of things from a life-changing event that turns someone's world upside down to simply trying to make sense of something that cannot be explained. The big picture changes in the United States, whether it's you know deindustrialization and people losing jobs or it's the increasing uh, ethnic and racial and religious diversity in the country that some people find very threatening because they have a view that, you know, the real America is white Christian America. And so uh, any of those kind of things that um, change people's sense of comfort or safety can can be exploited by people who want to promote, um, you know, ideologies of, of certain kinds of, uh, you know, white nationalism or religious nationalism. Mark Gifford, an English lecturer at the University of Texas at San Antonio, says a lot of times people cling to pseudoscience or conspiracies when their emotional needs aren't being met elsewhere. Would someone believe these things? What led them to this belief? And I feel like for QAnon and a lot of those types of things, it's a loss of control. Uh, the feeling of simply not having agency in our everyday lives, and this does supply them with a form of agency. In the first place, is that they are searching for something uh, in their social life uh, and that sense of belonging, that sense of meaning. Uh, and they find that in a world of other people that can help explain a very complex society and a very complex planet in seemingly simplistic ways and basically say, you are on the right side, you're fighting against the evil side and kind of break down what are otherwise incredibly complex phenomenon. The fallout from all the rhetoric has been devastating. In October, the Center for Strategic International Studies found that white supremacists or other like-minded groups 
were responsible for two-thirds of the terrorist plots and attacks just in the first eight months of 2020. The report also found that far-left groups, including anarchist and anti-fascist organizations, were responsible for about 20% of the total number of attacks during the same time period. This rise in extremism all culminated with the attack on the U.S. Capitol. Social media platforms have taken some action, but most notably after the riots at the Capitol. They began deleting certain accounts linked to these theories, but it didn't take long for people to argue that that move was a violation of freedom of speech. Digital journalist Ivan Herrera examines that argument and explains that purging the internet of bad information won't be so straightforward. Congress shall make no law abridging freedom of speech. Our First Amendment guarantees us the right to speak freely, but does that right have limits? Freedom of speech does not include the right to incite actions that would harm others, such as shouting fire in a crowded theater, and it excludes the right to make or distribute obscene materials, among a few other limitations. The American Bar Association says the First Amendment only limits government actors. That includes federal, state, and local. But private entities, such as social media giants like Facebook and Twitter, don't have to play by the same rules. Most recently, a number of social media platforms banned former President Donald Trump and some of his allies after the insurrection at the U.S. Capitol on January 6th. Fight like hell. The Pew Research Center says those media companies cited the belief that Trump's posts violated their terms of use and that his rhetoric could possibly incite more violence. As a liberal, you know, I may have been relieved when they took away President Trump's Twitter account at that particular moment. But, but Twitter could just as easily have been silencing somebody that I agree with, you know? And, and so I would not, I, I really am uncomfortable with that precedent. Republican leaders like Florida Governor Ron DeSantis say these Silicon Valley tech companies are limiting the freedom of speech of conservative Americans. On the one hand, you stop the spread of the information. And that's, I guess, a good thing if, it, if it's dangerous lies but it also reinforces the narrative for the people who believe it. And it's a, they say, well, look, we're onto the truth. It shows there's a cabal out there that's trying to silence us because they took away our Twitter accounts. So it makes them martyrs and it kind of intensifies uh, their, their feelings. The Associated Press reports that some Florida lawmakers are now taking action against big tech. Those proposals range from forcing social media platforms to give users a month's notice before their accounts are suspended or disabled, to allowing consumers to sue if they feel they've been treated unfairly. While it's uncertain how the state could gain the authority to act against these companies with a global reach, it does open up a national discussion of how internet companies are regulated in our country. It would take an act of Congress, which includes leaders in our House and Senate. And as of January, Democrats control both chambers and the White House. So where does that leave believers of QAnon? In a blog post dated January 12th, Twitter says it began its strong enforcement action on potentially harmful online behavior by permanently suspending 70,000 accounts. The company says the accounts engaged in sharing harmful QAnon content at scale and were dedicated to the propagation of the conspiracy theory. Following the Capitol riots, Facebook released a statement saying it would take action consistent with its policy banning militarized social movements and the violence-inducing conspiracy theory QAnon. The crackdowns from these tech companies led QAnon followers to fringe websites where they could continue to share more misinformation without being banned. So, is QAnon something bigger private media companies will be able to continue to censor? NPR reports QAnon podcasts are available on Apple and Google's platforms, and some political commentators like Fox's Tucker Carlson, as well as some members of Congress, have defended the movement. For now, it appears the sharing of information about this conspiracy theory will continue. How long that lasts remains to be seen. So the problem won't go away easily, but there are things you can do to help chip away at this issue. It's going to take a lot of work, but we talked to a few experts in this field who shared some strategies. Bad information is nothing new. As a fact-checking expert, Tom Truinard knows this. He's one of the founders of Fathom, a company that KSAT partnered with last year to create the Trust Index. But Truinard has noticed a growing trend in false claims being made. 
it's becoming more widespread. What we've started to see now, which maybe um, 10 years ago when I started working on this kind of stuff didn't happen is really around any um, big news story, there's going to be, be a certain amount of um, misinformation. So if you're seeing a lot of headlines about one topic or news event, it's only a matter of time before that information is taken and twisted into disinformation. And it's not easy to pinpoint who's to blame. We're all creators and consumers of media, so we're all responsible for the quality of the ecosystem. And we're all going to be responsible for cleaning it up. You have to uh, sort of feel the sense of responsibility that the information that you share um, could lead somebody to make um, a decision that could have really big consequences for their life. That requires all of us to practice media literacy, being able to assess which news clips and stories we consume are trustworthy. We haven't had a, a good opportunity to practice skills of logic and evidence and really kind of analyzing where, who are these sources and how do they fit together. Because now it's easier than ever for unreliable news stories to make their way into our social media feeds. Previously, you know, you kind of had to search this stuff out. So if you wanted to find some weird stuff, you had to go on weird websites. You had to go on somethingawful.com or you had to go into kind of like the bowels of 4chan on Chan boards. But now this stuff that used to be on the periphery of the internet has made its way into the largest social sites. Renee Hobbs is the director of the Media Education Lab at the University of Rhode Island. She says it's never been more important to practice media literacy skills and to understand how social media algorithms have created echo chambers. I don't know if you've ever been to somebody's house and you go, you say, okay, let's watch Netflix. And you go and you sit down to watch Netflix and you notice like their Netflix looks nothing like yours, right? It's a completely different set of choices that are presented. That's one example of the echo chamber in practice, but it's also true on YouTube, Facebook, and Amazon, and so many others. Understanding that and being sensitive to that can really help us start to realize how our own choices are narrowing or shaping, creating those filter bubbles um, that we talk about. So what can you do to get out of the bubble? One thing that I do is I try not to consume news through a social media platform. Go directly to a news site instead, like ksat.com, for instance. That way you can choose which stories you want to read instead of an algorithm picking for you. Be wary of any stories that elicit a particularly strong emotional reaction. Don't let the first thing be um, that you share it with as many people as you can. Um, take a pause, um, think about it, think about what the source's motivations might be here. Uh, think about, is there some context that's missing? Um, is there something which, if true, uh, would mean that this thing doesn't make sense? Um, start to ask, you know, pretty, pretty normal questions um, about the kind of things that you're seeing. And if you notice someone in your life buying into a conspiracy, try to have a conversation without resorting to insults. It's really difficult to say, you know, um, to your to your uncle or your grandmother, this logic doesn't make sense, or, you know, we really need to look at the source for that. These conversations are especially hard right now when we've become so polarized. Can we identify areas of common ground, even while acknowledging that we've kind of put a, put a thumbtack in this other area where we totally disagree? Um, can we still respect each other's humanity and, and say that we are not horrible human beings because we, we see this thing differently? When you are consuming news, practice skepticism. Skepticism and the scientific method is almost antithetical to the human condition. We're, we're as humans, we trust each other. You know, we form small tribes. That's just evolutionary fact. And we have to kind of fight against that. Stay vigilant and be on the lookout for misinformation, but know you don't have to mistrust everything. There's a lot of good information online too. There are reliable, trusted news sources out there. You have to slow down how you're interacting online and um, uh, approach um, the information that you see on social networks with a, uh, a slightly more cautious mindset. And it's important not to get discouraged and avoid news altogether. It's actually kind of dangerous to um, choose to rely on your orbit of friends 
for your news about the world, because that's what happens, right? You might not be watching the news, but the people around you are getting it from somewhere, and then they're telling you. Our KSET initiative that we launched in 2020 called the Trust Index verifies claims being made online. If you'd like to see some of our previous Trust Index reports or if there's something that you would like us to verify, go to KSAT.com and look for the Trust Index section under the News tab. Thanks for joining us for this episode of KSAT Explains. We'll see you right back here for a brand new episode next week.